Greetings, Shabbat Shalom. It was in uh, an Orthodox Jew who went to his rabbi, and he felt he felt he looked like he was kind of down. And so the rabbi said, "Well, what you know? What's 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 your problem?" And the man said, "Well, I'll have to confess, I uh, ate a meal with bread, and I didn't do the proper washing before I ate. Before I ate." And the rabbi said, "Well, oh, okay, it's a uh, you, it's, you shouldn't. That shouldn't be a habit." But and then he says, "But uh, it was." unkosher food and the rabbi says what you 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 you, you, were, you, you were eating in an in, in an unkosher restaurant he said well yeah he said he said why he said well all the kosher restaurants were closed why why were all the kosher restaurants closed well it was Yom Kippur so uh, you could understand why he felt bad now the Day of Atonement, one should not be eating at all. That does lead me to a discussion, which is uh, one that could go on and on and on. It's really from cover to cover through the Bible, the subject of justice and mercy. Justice and mercy. We know that God is perfect, perfect character, righteous character. We know that he's perfect love. We know he's a God of justice. We know he's a God of mercy. There is, I believe, a tension between those concepts. Now, maybe there wouldn't be if we understood them fully, but at least on my level, uh, it, it seems to be that there's a tension between justice and mercy and how to, uh, when to focus on one and when to focus on the other. Now, God has the perfect balance if there is such a thing as balance in that field, if, there, if that tension is there, then God has the perfect balance between justice and mercy. We, in the terrestrial realm, have to do the best we can with God's help. But it is interesting to study into these matters. For example, in Luke 6, in verse 36, we're told, Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, years ago I was on the faculty of, of a college out west and I had a faculty aide, uh, a, a young lady from British Columbia. And um, evidently she came from a fairly cons conservative family and that's fine. But she told me that working uh, under me, she, she learned how to be more merciful. So I took that as a compliment, that as a faculty member, I was considered merciful. Hopefully not a pushover, one who maintains standards, but yet merciful. And uh, Jesus says here, therefore, be merciful just as your father also is merciful. Yet at the same time, uh, you know, in the same Bible, we read what the Apostle Paul says, that we have to maintain our standards personally and as a community, as, a, as congregations. Here is 1 Corinthians 5, and uh, here is what he says about somebody who is blatantly sinning in that congregation. It's well known, and they, the congregation has to get together and deal with it. He says in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 5, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This fellow needs to be put out of the community and deal with the world out there, you know, without us as, as a network. You know, he needs to understand the gravity of his sin. He needs to be put out of the community, what we might call disfellowshipment. In some some uh, communities, they might call it excommunication. Let's take a look at Hebrews 4. And here we see again the mercy of God, for which we're so very, very grateful. Uh, Hebrews 4, and I want to go to verse 14. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. God, in effect, you know, God became human, so we can't complain to him and say, you don't know what it's like. Of course, he knows anyway, but he experienced, he was willing to experience it. And you know what he else he experienced. All of the suffering that he experienced in the flesh for us. In verse uh, 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. To obtain mercy. We need mercy. And God is merciful. And yet, in the same book of Hebrews, we're told, Hebrews 12, and, uh, well, let's go first to Hebrews 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews 10 and verse 31. It is a fearful thing to, halt, to fall into the hands of the living God. So God is a just God. And uh, at the end of the 12th chapter, Verse 29 of chapter 12, For our God is a consuming fire. And ultimately, those who are incorrigible will be dead. They will be annihilated. They will burn up and be ashes. They will be put out of their misery. No longer will they be miserable or make others miserable. That's the ultimate destiny of the wicked. So as I said, all through the Bible we have... We have this tension between justice and mercy. And we do need to have an understanding of both. And we're not going to, I think, ever get it totally right in the flesh <clears throat> as teachers, as preachers, as parents, uh, you know, as spouses, and on and on it goes, but uh, as, as employee, employers and all the rest of it. But we can do the best we can with God's help. <clears throat> Look what happened in the case of Genesis 18, Abraham had a discussion with God, a just God and a merciful God, perfectly just and perfectly merciful. Uh, in uh, Genesis uh, 18 and verse 20, And the Eternal said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Well, he's speaking, of course, anthropomorphically he's, he's going to uh, as I said he, he does does the right thing and the just thing and the merciful thing and in this case even though he's omniscient and omnipresent he, he says he's going to investigate the matter to Abraham and then in verse 23 Abraham says and Abraham came near and said would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked so Abraham is pleading for the city it's, the city is very wicked but what if a certain minority is not wicked? What about, what, what about what if, will, will, can you, will you save the city for their sake? Verse 424, suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spirit for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far! It's, it's incredible how Abraham speaks to God in this way. But he had a relationship with God that few, few ever had. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? <laughs> so the Eternal said, and by the way, uh, in Jewish tradition, in the Hebrew-speaking world, when, you, when, we, when we speak of Elohim, we're speaking of what we call Midat Hadin, the characteristic, the quality of judgment, of law. And when we speak of uh, Yahweh, although nowadays it's not pronounced, Adonai. We speak of Midat Harachamim, the uh, principle of uh, compassion, the quality, the characteristic of compassion, what I'm speaking about today. So the Eternal said, if I find, uh, I'm speaking about both, Midat Hadin and Midat Harachamim. So the Eternal said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Now look what finally happens. He goes to, Abraham goes to haggling, as is the case, you know, you go to the Middle East, you go to the Suk, or in Hebrew, the Shuk, 
and uh, there's this haggling that goes on. We had that experience also in, in Mexico. Uh, let's go to verse 32 of, Exodus, of Genesis 18. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. <clears throat> now that's very interesting, because he's saying, not I'm going to take these ten out of there, but if there are ten righteous people in the, in the town, I'll spare the whole town for the sake of those ten. It's quite interesting. It does show God's mercy. You know, there's a Jewish tradition, I, I won't go into all the background of it, but that for, because of 36 righteous people, the world uh, continues to exist. It's as God said, you know, maybe I will turn there in Matthew 24, 22, uh, because again, it does show God's mercy. Matthew 24 and verse uh, 22 He's talking about the tribulation before the coming of Christ. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So a very intense punishment is coming on the world for its wickedness, but yet a short one. I'd like to go to um, Psalm 145. which is alphabetically organized, uh, and I want to go to um, what should be the eighth verse. begins with the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The reason there are 21 verses is because one verse combines two letters, and there are reasons for that too, but I won't go into that today. But in Psalm 145, we read in, in, ver uh, in verse 8, The Eternal is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. And um, this is, of course, as what we see throughout the Bible. This is what we see in the discussion with Abraham. But God wants us to maintain high standards in our personal life and high standards in, in our congregations. And we find that when the priesthood was officially inaugurated, Aaron and his descendants, and I'm one of them now, but Aaron and his descendants, when they were first inaugurated into the priesthood, God was very particular about maintaining standards then. And there are times when he is partic particularly powerful in his intervention to set a certain standard and it doesn't necessarily mean this is always how he acts. And this is why some people blaspheme, and I pity them. And they think that just because they're not struck immediately that uh, they're getting away with it. I feel sorry for such people. And God, it is God's mercy that they, that they do get away with it for a moment, you know, for a period of time. You don't ever really get away with such things, but there are people who blaspheme and think that you know, that they're being really, really cute. As I said, I pity such people. But there are times when God really powerfully intervened to, to set a precedent, to set a standard. And one of those times was that the priesthood was being officially inaugurated. I'm in Leviticus 10. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Eternal, which he had not commanded them. So there are various commentators that study into this matter what exactly was the nature of their offense. But they went against the prescribed manner for offering the incense. They violated various, I think, various prohibitions uh, that they should have known about uh, in, in what they did. And this was the very installation of the priesthood going on here. And God wanted standards maintained very carefully. And so this was a direct challenge. So fire went out from the eternal and devoured them. And they died before the eternal. So evidently as the, at the entrance of the tabernacle, uh, they, they were suddenly, they were suddenly uh, killed but not consumed, the bodies were there. 
uh, I want to go to verse 3. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Eternal spoke, saying, by, but, but by those who come near me I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. This was their father, but their father had to realize they're my sons, but they, they did wrong. They sinned. Then Moses called Mishael and Elsaphon, the sons of Uziel. By the way, they were, he had other sons, and of course the priesthood continues to this day. Then Moses called Mishael and Elsaphon, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said of, 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 to them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp, as Moses had said. And then he told the other sons and Aaron, don't show outward signs of mourning. Acknowledge this was a divine judgment. Yes, of course. How could you not be emotionally distraught? But don't show it openly so that people understand you accept God's decision. And it, Moses said to Aaron and to Eliezer and Ithamar, his sons, <clears throat> do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Eternal has kindled. So yes, Israel as a whole can mourn. This indeed was a tragedy. But the family itself needed to show we affirm God's judgment in this matter, and we will do better as a family from here on out. Now let me go on to um, go to verse 16 of this chapter. Then Moses made careful inquiry about the goat of the sin offering. Now they were supposed to eat it. Uh, after uh, the, the offering was made, it was going to be eaten by the priests, and this was a, a ritual of atonement for the congregation, evidently. Then Moses made careful inquiry about the goat of the sin offering, and there it was, burned up. So they had, they had consumed all of it. They hadn't eaten it. And he was angry with Eliezer and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, who were left, saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in a holy place, since it is most holy? And God has given it to you to bear the guilt of the congregation. In other words, you didn't finish the ritual. You were supposed to eat th this offering. It, uh, let's go back. I interrupted the verse. I'm going to read the whole verse now and not interrupt myself. Why have you not eaten the sin offering in a holy place since it is most holy? And God has given it to you to bear the guilt of the congregation to make atonement for them before the eternal. See, its blood was not brought inside the holy place. Indeed, you should have eaten it in a holy place as I commanded. You know, I explained to you what was necessary, what was required. And Aaron said to Moses, Look, this day they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Eternal, and such things have befallen me. This great tragedy has occurred. And so, in effect, he, he's saying, I am unworthy to carry out this ritual today. We have been tainted. We have been um, found wanting in our responsibilities as a family as a priestly family and two of our number have been taken because of their sin so we are not really in a spiritual condition to complete this ritual so that, that's evidently what Aaron is telling him here uh, and Aaron said to Moses look this day they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the eternal and such things have befallen me if I had eaten the sin offering today would it have been accepted in the sight of the eternal so when Moses heard that, he was content. Now, when I read it, I, I think there is another possibility, and I, perhaps commentaries debate on this one, that perhaps Aaron was saying, I'm not in a proper frame of mind today. I have been bereaved of two of my sons, and I'm not questioning God's judgment, but nevertheless, look at how do you think I feel? And so I'm really not in any condition to do this with the appropriate attitude today. And so in that case, God's mercy would be, I understand. You didn't, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's, but 
you had a terrible disaster in your life. You're just not in the proper frame of mind to do it. I understand. And that would again be God's mercy. And Moses, it says, look what it says in verse 20. So when Moses heard that, he was content. He was satisfied with Aaron's answer. So perhaps this also is a, an example of God's mercy. Right after you see the example of the justice. Now, it, this world, as you know, dis, distorts justice. This is a very oppressive world in many ways. And there's a great deal of injustice. In Psalm 94, we find that ultimately things are going to work out. Look at verse 15 of Psalm 94 and think of the future that this Sabbath day pictures. I'm speaking on a weekly Sabbath which foreshadows the millennium. Verse 15, but judgment will return to righteousness and all the upright in heart will follow it. So ultimately, things will be fair. Things will be just in that future time. And there will also be, of course, as we understand, great mercy in that future time. I'd like to uh, go now to Acts 10. I'm sorry, Acts 5. I want to begin by at the end of chapter 4 of Acts. Here we have people committing their, their possessions to be sold and donating it to the church, to the community there, so that people would have enough. There was a tremendous uh, explosion of the church at that time, tremendous impact of the gospel message there at Jerusalem. The church was growing, and people were coming together, and it was such a special time. It was the initial, it was the beginning of the New Testament church. Pentecost was the beginning, and then this is the post-Pentecost season, and we're in that time now, too, for that matter. And uh, at this point, people are coming together in the community and sharing their resources so that life can continue as, as they're devoting so much time to preaching the gospel and, and, and working with new people and so on. So we have in verse uh, chapter 4, verse uh, 35, uh, well, I'm going to go back to verse <coughs> 33, uh, even, even earlier than that. Uh, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So this was a very special time in the history of the church as its beginning its efforts, which ultimately were to go worldwide. So people came together, pooled their resources. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses and uh, sold them and, bought the, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. Uh, evidently, there were many people who perhaps were still hanging around from, from visiting on Pentecost that remained there to, to be instructed so that they could then go home and raise up congregations all around the world. As I said, this is a very special time. The, uh, we, we have now, in effect, the the, the, the uh, kernel, the germ, the nucleus of what would become a worldwide church. So I'm going to go back to verse 34. I keep interrupting myself as I read verses. Now, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So everything is rolling right along, just as, you know, when the priesthood was inaugurated in those days. That was the beginning of the, of the Old Covenant Church. I read about that earlier. And I read about a decisive act of God to keep that church on track, and the same thing happens here. Uh, this is now the beginning of the New Testament church. Verse 5, chapter 5 of Acts. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he claimed that he, <laughs> I guess, that he was giving it all, but he wasn't. He held back some. In other words, he lied. 
He was dishonest. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While, I re while it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. He lied to the Holy Spirit. He lied to God. Now, do you think whenever a person lies to a minister, zot? No, that's not what happens. But here it did. Here it did. That, set, that shows the standard. And this was the beginning of the church, and God was being very particular in the beginning. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last, like the case of Nadab and Abihu. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. You could imagine, right? I'm adding. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him, as we saw in the case of Lydicus 10. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look! The feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And now let's go to verse 14. And right after this, you see again God's mercy. And believers were increasing, increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, verse 15, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Again, God's justice, God's mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are listening to me, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, whoever may be listening, there were demands of justice. There were demands of justice. But there was also God's mercy in human history there were the demands of justice and there were God, and there was God's mercy Romans 6 and verse 23 for the wages of sin is death Romans 6 23 but the gift of God the gift of God we didn't earn it but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord when we have the New Testament Passover season, we tend then to focus, but we should be every day, you know, focusing on this. We, we pray when we, we, we say our prayers each day, we pray in Jesus' name. And we remember, as I read earlier about high, our, our high priest, the word of God became a fertilized egg in the womb of Mary, went through the birthing, the birth process, growing up, you know, young adulthood, uh, family responsibility after the death of his father, evidently, and then taking on the ministry that he took on and going through every conceivable kind of humiliation and punishment and torture and finally death so that all of the demands of justice were fulfilled in him because through him we were all created. He was responsible for all of us being here and so he took on that responsibility and took on the penalty on himself. Now he's our resurrected high priest, and so we now have that mercy extended to us. The justice was fulfilled in the uh, sacrifice of Christ, and now comes the, the, and that was, of course, the greatest possible act of mercy. And so now we can go to a just God and a merciful God and look to him for salvation. So I want to conclude this brief discussion of this, this vast subject, the subject of justice and mercy. And as I said, we, sh we should strive as servants of God, as human beings created in the image of God, and we as Christians should strive 
to be just and to be merciful. But we're never going to get it, I believe, perfectly right. But God has gotten it perfectly right forever. He always has been, always will be, perfectly just and perfectly merciful. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that uh, the world through him might be saved. Perfect justice, perfect mercy. Please remember that we have not far from now in time the autumn festival season coming up. <clears throat> we hope to see many of you for the eight days uh, as that season concludes uh, near, near Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, where we plan to be holding services. But wh whatever your plans are for that season of the year and whatever your plans are for the days ahead, all the best to you and yours.